Good day and welcome to BizTech on Ghana Web TV, where we bring you an exclusive package on business news that made headlines during the week and an insightful interview. My name is Na Oyokwoti. Now, when people talk about robotics, the first thing that comes to mind are moving objects. But did you know that static devices made of metals are also robots? On this episode, we speak to Chief Executive Officer of Karl Marx Robotics, and he's in the person of Frank Liman Khalid. His outfit trains children below 10 years to assemble and create their own robots. My colleague Ernestina Sewa Asante has the scoop. Stay tuned. I personally haven't witnessed anyone assemble robots before, and I know you watching this video haven't too. We are lucky to have a robotics trainer and a mobile app developer who is going to give us an insight into what goes into the creation of robots as well as the development of an app. Stay with us. Hello, Frank, and welcome to Hi. this tech. Hello, how are you doing? I'm fine, yourself? I'm blessed by grace. Okay. You are into robotics. So yeah. in your view, what is a robot? Um, so basically, we teach our kids to, that's one of the first things we teach in our robotics club. A robot is an electronic device that is programmed to perform a specific task. So a robot can be in the form of a human. That's what we call the humanoids. It can be probably in the form of a car, like just this, this one. Oh. And it can even be a, a standing robot, something that doesn't really move, or an mobile robot, maybe like a traffic light or an electronic door system and all of those things, an alarm system. So all these things are robots. Okay, so normally when people talk about robots, mm. their mind goes to something that moves, something that does some movement of some sort. But you can have static devices as robots. The, the, the definition of the robot is any electronic device mm. that is programmed. So once people can program it to do a specific task, it qualifies to be a robot. Okay, I wouldn't want to go too much into the technicalities, but um, when something is programmable, it means you can give it a set of instructions to follow. Mm. That's through the programming and the codes and all of that. So that is the, I think, the underlining definition of what a robot is. So it comes in different forms. Uh, you know what the, the banks use uh, when you open the door automatically opens. Mm -hmm. If in, even those uh, sanitizers where you pass your hand and then the mm -hmm. automatic sanitizers, they are all forms of robots. But it just depends on the level of development or the advancement of the robots. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what are the components of robots? Uh, <laughs> so we have something that we call the microcontroller. If I, let me just show you this. Yeah. Okay. So. When we talk of a robot, this is how we teach our students, the kids, three major parts of the robot. So we have the first part, that is the microcontroller. It's more like the microchip, um, where the, it's like your brain, where the coding takes place, where the decisions are being made, calculations, like the way your brain thinks and reasons. That is the microcontroller. Mm. Then we have the second part, that is called the sensor. So the sensor is like your eyes, your nose, your skin, those um, parts of your body that detects uh, maybe changes in the environment, changes in weather, if you're going to hit a wall. So that is what this device, so this is what you call an ultrasonic sensor that identifies an obstacle. So when this car is going to hit a wall, this, the, the eyes, quote and unquote, will be able to detect that obstacle okay. and change the robot's path. So these are the main parts, the most important parts in the robot. Okay. So humans have feelings and you're saying the robots too can sense danger or anything do robots have feelings <laughs> so it's it's a very interesting question but this is what i'll say robots have feelings to some sort all right i won't say feelings as in the kind of feelings human beings have like in terms of emotions but i'll say robots can detect some 
some changes in the environment. Like for example, we could have a robot in the room that maybe blows an alarm when a thief enters in. So the thief comes in to change the environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe a robot that maybe automatically turns the generator on when the light goes off. So the robot is able to sense when the power is off. Okay, maybe, so it depends. For example, this robot, for instance, okay. it has a sensor that detects a wall. Some of them can detect temperature. You get it. So, um, for example, you, you, as you sit here. Now, if the air condition goes off and the place is hot, you, your skin will begin to sweat, yeah. all right, because your skin has detected that the, the, the condition of the weather has changed or the temperature has changed. So your, your, your skin is responding to that change in temperature. That is what, so that feeling that your skin is experiencing is able to communicate to your body and sweat. You get it. Now, in a robot, we could have what you call a temperature sensor in the robot too. So the robot, to some extent, can also detect a change in the, in the, in the, uh, in the temperature, just like the way your skin is able to detect. So to, to that kind of feelings, mm -hmm. the robot is able to detect. But for example, something like love, uh, <laughs> sorrow, no, no, no. The robot hasn't gotten to that level yet. But we see them in the movies. Yes, yes, movies, more of fiction. It's more of fiction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So how are robots created? Okay, so <laughs> very interesting question. I think you're asking me technical questions today. <laughs> so um, this, this, so I'll equate it to what we teach our kids. Okay. All right, so this was a toy car that um you know some of these kids that we teach they are maybe 10 years nine years eight years 11 years getting into teenage now they have all have toys at home and all of that now instead of throwing this toy away maybe making it e-waste and all of that we teach them to transform this toy into a robot mm -hmm. okay so that is how we start transforming toys to robots so what we did was that we just took the microcontroller or the microchip, we fixed it in, did a few connections, added a few sensors, and that was how we created our robot. Mm -hmm. So you can have robots created in different forms. You can have it assembled, you can have it created from something. So those are the different stages. That, it depends on your level. And then we also have levels where they just assemble it. They just put it together. It's already done. So all they need to do is just put it together and then it starts working. So it really depends on where you are coming from and how advanced you are. Okay, so I can see wires and other forms of things. Mm. Does it mean you need maybe a mechanical engineering background to be able to um, develop or assemble a robot? Yes, um, not mechanical engineer per se. We've had a couple of uh, interns from the university. Some of them have worked with us for a couple of years and all of that. So um, you need a background in at least engineering. Okay. It makes it easier. So, um, well, we have people from other backgrounds who just want to learn. It's also possible, but it's easier when you have probably a science background from SS mm -hmm. because some of these things like wires, resistors, all of those things have maybe some foundations in, in science, integrated science and all of that. So we use engineers, um, computer engineers especially, Electric, electronic engineers especially, and then maybe a few other engineers who have some knowledge in microcontroller okay. technology and all of that. How yeah. about coding? Okay, so coding, um, for example, when you have a robot, mm. okay, I don't know whether I can take this one. Yeah, you can. Okay, so this is a spider robot. It's called a quadruped. It has four legs. It's used for surveillance purposes, probably when you are in wildlife reserves. They put a camera on it and it's able to navigate. So, for example, something like this is a robot. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two aspects of the robot. There is the coding aspect, like you're talking about, and then there is the hardware part, mm -hmm. software and hardware. So, the hardware part is the engineering, the connection of the wires, the voltage. You know, when you came, you saw me do some connections on these things. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any knowledge in it, you could bend something out yeah. or destroy something. Yeah, so that's the, hard, that's the difference between robotics and then maybe coding. Mm -hmm. Maybe when we get to the mobile app development, I'll talk about it. Then the coding is after you've built a robot, you need a software or a code that can run. That will n let the robot know how it's supposed to operate. That, that's what you call the programming. That is the coding aspect of the robot. So one needs the other to work, you know. But for example, when you think of an app, an app is just coding. Mm -hmm. 
It's just code. It doesn't really need any hardware, but robotics usually does. Okay. Yeah. So, talking of the human form of robots, okay. sometimes you ask them questions and then they are able to answer. How is this done? How does it come to life? Okay. A uh, very good question. Um, maybe, you know, so we have something we call speech recognition. Um, I don't know whether you've used it in Siri mm. or Google and all of that. Mm. That is the foundation of, of all of these things. I, I remember when I was in the university, I, almost like a lot of years ago, you know, that was a project we worked on. That, that was actually what ushered, us, uh, ushered me into robotics, training kids in robotics. So we built a car, something like this, mm. that responds to human voices. Wow. Like, so just about five or six signals move, and then the car goes reverse it reverses turn right it turns right turn left it turns left and then rotate i think rotate at that time so we used what you call speech recognition where like for you say you say hello google open opera mm -hmm. or open mozilla firefox or something that word is transformed i won't go into the technicalities of it but it's transferred into it is transformed into a signal and then you use that in programming so all of those things are possible they are not difficult so you can make a robot to recognize your speech. Oh, okay. it's, 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 not, it's not so difficult. It, then it used to be very difficult, but now it's not so abstract. Mm -hmm. There is a technology or there, uh, there is a code to handle all of those things. So all you have to do is just take it and then work it. So it's possible. It's a very possible project. Okay. So some robots make use of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Is there a difference between artificial intelligence and robots or... Yeah, so um, another good question again. I don't know, today you're asking me so many good questions. <laughs> and so um, this, for example, mm. uh, people normally think AI, artificial intelligence, is something really complex. It's just artificial intelligence. You see, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. how robots can be in a way intelligent. Mm. For example, this could have just been a car, just a toy car. So if we put on a toy car, it just runs. If it goes into a wall, it hits the wall, and that's it. But when we say intelligence, then that robot should have some form of intelligence. For example, you like this. If you're going to hit a wall, and you see you turn your, your you won't go. If there's a there's a ditch somewhere, you won't just fall into it. Yeah. So that component or that that intelligence is what that at, we put the artificial type of it in a machine. So a machine is not just a machine. It's able to sense things. So the, the way this robot is able to detect this sensor, ultrasonic sensor, is able to detect an obstacle and change its path and move in another direction. That's what makes it AI. Mm. AI can come in different forms, okay? But it just makes the robot in a way reason, not just a machine, but it reasons and knows that mm, there is a, there's a ditch here, there is fire here, there is this here. Those are the kind of sensors that are used. That's what AI is about. And they are all programmed by humans. Yes, they are all programmed by humans. Okay. So do you share in the assertion that in few years to come, um, robots, first it was AI will take over the world, mm -hmm. and activities of humans. Mm -hmm. You being into robotics, do you also think very soon robots will take over the works of humans? Okay, I think it's started. This is one of the things we tell a lot of the parents who enroll their awards in the robotics program. That you see, uh, your 10 years from now, 15 years from now, all right, what future are you creating for your kids? Mm -hmm. if, 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 you are, if you want to just be a doctor, you can't just be a doctor anymore. A doctor that uses technology. If you are into banking, you can't just be a banker anymore. Now we have ATM machines that accept cash. How did this happen? You know, 10 years of 20 years ago, I don't think you could, there was even internet banking. Yeah. Now you get it. So now many banks are employing very less number of staff, less mm -hmm. number of staff and tellers. Every business is trying to minimize costs. So if they can find a technology that can replace you, I, it's, it's possible that. So I feel it started. It just maybe it's not really mainstream like that. Security men, now we have automatic doors. That when you're coming in, it automatically opens and closes. You get it. So now the security man at the bank doesn't have to open the door for you again. Mm -hmm. There's a machine that can do that in many of the supermarkets. So it is, the world is getting there. Sorry, the world is really getting there. So I feel um, these are things that 
a lot of parents should start looking into the future and investing in their children in STEM education. I'm trying to picture how robots will take over the educational sector. How is that possible? Okay, so we could have um, e-learning platforms. Um, now, uh, you have maybe things like Khan Academy. Yes, you have instructors and all of those things, but it, it could get to a time where a machine, maybe not the, the typical classroom you're looking at, now, you know, e-learning is a thing now. Yes. Yeah, so it could be a robot or a machine behind the scenes that is doing the instruction. If it's coding, robots could be doing training, maybe not 100%, but to some point. Okay, to some point. The students take an exam. Teachers don't need to mark papers anymore. The thing automatically calculates their scores and results and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So it's not just maybe a robot like this, but we are looking at a whole system of technology, whether it is software, hardware, robots, mm -hmm. web, is taking over a lot of things. So, uh, if you want to be an architect, you have to have a background in technology, coding of some sort. If you want to be a mechanical engineering, you need to have a background of STEM. So now it's not like um, STEM is uh, something for only those who like science. It's like math. Everybody needs to know it. All right. The conversation is getting very interesting, but we are taking a breather. Don't go away. Powers and principalities. There's so much fire! hillside at the Koshi rubbish dump collapsed. Come back from the break. I told you earlier that Frank is also a mobile app developer, so we'll be delving deeper into that. Now, tell us how do you create a mobile app? Okay, so um, initially the mobile app development was not part of the, the whole service we ran. When the COVID era came in, okay. then the opportunity came out, and as a business, we also took advantage of that. Um, so we use a very simple platform. Um, the mobile app development is for our students. We use what we call the AI MIT App Inventor, a really wonderful platform uh, that's really simple and comprehensive platform by Google. That use is a block, what they call block programming. So that's what we take, and that is online, it's strictly online. So that's how we also interact with our kids and all of that, building apps on iOS and Android. And several amazing apps um, by built by the kids. Okay. Yeah. What are some of the apps they've built so far? Okay, so just yesterday we built a GPS tracker app. So that an app that helps you track your position. For government or oh no 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 for for <laughs> just just <laughs> just yeah need. just the kids you okay. know we create login screens, calculator apps, um, handwriting apps. Um, you know where you have a whiteboard, you know on your phone. You, you can just use your yeah. thing, yeah, just scribble and all of that. Several amazing apps that the kids have been building. Um, I'm sure I'll even share some of them with you as you mm. see. Yeah, so, so many amazing apps, okay. both education-wise and, you know, just in their normal life. Okay, so how do you track the progress of your students? Yeah, that's also good. We give them projects. Um, we give them projects um, at the end of every class and at the end of every month, major projects. So then we're able to know based upon, it's mostly practical, uh, unlike the regular school training and all of that. So that is where we're able to get a lot of the kids getting interested in it. So yeah, we give them projects and based on their abilities to submit the project, we, we use that to track and monitor how their performances are and how they are getting the whole coding experience. Okay. Yeah. So for someone like me who don't have any knowledge in it, and I want to build maybe a fashion yeah. app, how do I go about it? 
Okay, so you come in, you, you enroll in the robot in the mobile app development <laughs> class. That's okay. the first thing. But it's very easy. Um, in just two settings, you build in the first setting. Okay, in the second setting, you build your first app. It's so easy. It's different from the you know the more technical ones that the other programmers use and all of that. It is something very virtual. So you will see what you're doing. If it's a button, you drag it here. If it's a fashion app, pictures, you see everything just in real time. You know, very little code. You don't need coding. It's just what they call block programming. Just fitting in some puzzles. That is how the coding works. And then the real designer is like you're designing, uh, maybe painting something. That's, that's how it works. Okay. Yeah. So in the first sitting, what do I learn? So the first thing we just introduce you to the whole environment, how the software, the platform, uh, it, it's a really awesome, and I think it was made for beginners, people who have difficulties learning programming, and it's able to do so many things, really, like it, it's, it's a very good platform. So um, the, we just introduce you to the whole experience, and then the second you create your first app, you run it on your phone, and that's how it keeps going. You keep adding to what you already know, keep adding to what you already know. And in less than six weeks, you should be a very good programmer. Okay. So when I enroll onto your school or your platform, how much do I pay? Okay, now you have to see me after. <laughs> to okay, me. if not for me, our viewers. Okay, so, oh. <laughs> so for anyone who wants to enroll the award, um, first of all, you just need to visit, just go to Google and type CalMax Robotics. Uh, CalMax Robotics. Um, just go to Google. The first link. So K H A L M A X, then robotics. K H A L M A X, then robotics. The first link you go in there, it will ask you to enroll. Okay, mm -hmm. it is 300 CDs a term. Cool, 300 CDs a term. Oh, okay. okay, so it's it's we do it online. Okay, we meet between twice to thrice a week, and then it's usually after school hours. Mm -hmm. So all that we need from the the parent or the student is there. App, like the parents' permission to join or the parents' approval, and then we need a Gmail account. All the kid needs is a computer, a very good internet connection, and maybe a mobile phone or a tablet, so that when he builds the app, he can test it on his phone and see how it works. Okay. That's all. Is but it restricted to just children? How about grown-ups? Yeah, so you want to join, right? Yeah. yeah so <laughs> for, for something like that, for something like that, we can create, but you just that maybe your class will be different from the kids. We, we normally categorize them in age groups based upon their level of experience so mm. yeah it's all possible it's yeah, all possible that would that would affect the pricing no the pricing is constant oh okay yeah so 300 cds a time i don't think it's, it's it's very cool you know yeah. yeah okay your advice to people who think we are still going to be the same forever and are not taking advantage of technology what do you have to tell them so i just have very little to tell them but a typical scenario is COVID, mm. you know. Um, people used to look down e-learning until COVID hits. And if you are a school, I heard so many schools close down, yeah. so many schools close down, not just go on, on hiatus, but they close down because they were resistant to, you know, before I used to sell software to schools, a lot of them were frowning on it and all of that. But when COVID hit, it made people understand that you have to go digital now. Okay, and if you don't innovate, you die. We don't know when the next disruption is going to come. So you have to be prepared. And technology is the only way that can pr protect you from some of these things. If you are going virtual, a lot of people lost their jobs and all of that. For example, when I was doing robotics in the schools, we were using physical training and all of that. When COVID hit, we didn't know what, like, you know, on the, on the onset, we didn't know the lockdown came. Then the idea came, why don't we move? digital, virtual, e-learning. If not, I would have also been out of business. You get it. So if you don't embrace certain changes that are coming, a time will come, you'll be out of the system. That's why we have a saying, you either innovate or you die. You die out in business. So that is my, my, my advice to institutions, companies, and all of that, that don't want to go to, you, you can't survive for long in this system. You've heard it all from Frank, and as he said, it's either you innovate or you die out of business. So upgrade yourself with the advent of technology and personally grow yourself and your business. This has been the edition of BizTech on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ernestina Sewa Asante.
Amazing stuff right there by CalMax Robotics. But our friend Jefferson Senayaja is on standby to help us with some helpful internet tools. <laughs> Hello there. My name is Jefferson Senior from After Music. This week on Tech Bits, I want us to talk about remote working tools. These are tools that help us to connect to another computer without the main computer being on the same network. Now, I'm going to numb it down so that you don't uh, run away. Remote working tools are good because it helps us connect to another computer. Now, you can have a friend or a relative that can call you and tell you, look, I'm having a problem with my computer, but I don't know how to do this, or hey, I'm trying to fix this spreadsheet, I don't know how to do it now. You can easily do a video call and you can easily look at the person's uh, screen with a video call, but there's an easier way of working that way. Uh, you can actually remote into the person's laptop, that's the word, remote into the person's laptop, whilst sitting right in your home and actually still on from your laptop and there are great tools which has been around for years now and we're going to go through this series of remote working tools that will help us actually still function and still get to uh, help each other out uh, throughout the years so let's get to it so the remote tool for this week is called team viewer team viewer is an industry standard software that has been there and is used professionally uh, for some time now. The spelling is T U R. That's T E A M V I E W E R. It's very very simple. Team Viewer. Uh, it's it's for remote access and remote desktop uh, uh, connection. So we just go to the website. That's TeamViewer.com. Is the first thing that pops up. Remote access and support. Now a lot of you, uh, 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 those that are new to this software, um, might get all confused. Don't worry. There's a home version. There is one that can be used for free. You don't necessarily have to buy the, the full version of it. Uh, you, and it's now available for private for free for non-commercial use. For those that check it out and actually want to use it for companies, it's available for, for uh, uh, a whole set of subscription packages that you can you can uh, uh, pass on to. But since this is for remote work for, for home, you can just go and click on the download button and it will uh, uh, give you the options whether you want to download the free trial or the pilot trial and there you get a pop-up to download it once you download it it's in YouTube. tool I already have team viewer in my uh, account so what I'll just do is I'll just bring it up team viewer and that and how it works is very simple your partner also gets the same software so your partner has a copy of it you also have a copy of it every computer who, that has a team viewer has a unique ID number and a password so once you are connecting to someone's computer you ask for the person's id number and you click on connect and you ask for the person's password and they, they connect once you click on the connect it connects directly into the person's laptop and that way you can be able to help the person out or even see what the person is seeing the security behind this is very very uh, um, secure there's so many aspects and so many tools you can set up meetings presentations you can set up that it's almost uh, an alternative to zoom except the video calling aspect but it's a great tool for uh, remote access and remote control of, 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 of desktops and I recommend everyone to check it out that's team viewer that's T E A M V I E W E R so that's it for this week next week we're going to learn more about remote working tools and see how effective they could be I'll see you again next time it's now time for the business headlines and our stories are going to begin with the 2021 budget which was read some hours ago and our first story is on the total crude oil production and according to Oseche Mensa Bonsu, majority leader in parliament has said that Total crude oil production for the 2020 fiscal year was 66.9 million barrels as compared to 71.4 million barrels of production in 2019. He said the National Petroleum Corporation was able to transport over 88.4 standard cubic feet of gas to the Ghana National Gas Company, GNPC, 
He said this while presenting he said this while presenting the twenty twenty one budget statement in Parliament. It's not coming. Still on the 2021 budget, Minister of Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Caretaker Minister for Finance, Osei Chairman Sabonsu, has said that the government's coronavirus alleviation and revitalization of enterprise support initiative is a singular and remarkable financial investment in the Ghanaian economy by a certain government. Presenting the 2021 budget statement and economic policy on the floor of Parliament on Friday, March 12, 2021, Mr. Oche, Osei Chain Mensa Bonsu, who is also MP for the Swami constituency, said the Obatampa program in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic is meant to cushion Ghanaians and businesses against the adverse economic effects of the virus. He said the 100 billion investment into the Ghanaian economy is meant to revitalize the economy that has been undone by the global pandemic and put it back to pre-COVID-19 levels. President Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado has disclosed that government plans to retable before parliament the Ejapa royalties transaction. The controversial gold royalty deal was put on suspension after civil society organizations, members of parliament and a section of the public rejected it, saying it was not going to serve the best interest of the country. But President Ekufuado delivering his State of the Nation address on Tuesday, March 9th, told Parliament his government intends to further engage lawmakers on the future of the transaction. Mr. Speaker, let me at this point assure the House that in the course of this session of Parliament, the government will come back to engage the House on the steps it intends to take on the future of the Ejapa transaction. On GDP, Ghana's debt will hit approximately 75% of gross domestic product. Total value of goods and services produced in an economy within a period from 2024. International Ratings Agency Fitch has said in its latest report on energy sector debt, a risk to Ghanaians post-pandemic debt trajectory. According Accordingly, the debts will continue to rise in 2021 and 2022 due to high COVID pandemic-related spending and the realization of energy sector liabilities. Fitch affirmed Ghana's sovereign ratings in October 2020 on an expectation of a gradual recovery, both in economic performance and fiscal revenue following the pandemic shock, the availability of external and domestic financing sources, and the eventual stabilization of debt. The report said, however, Ghana's public finances are complicated by a history of domestic arrears and by contingent liabilities that will continue to add to its public debt stock. Now an update on the coronavirus pandemic. President Nana Adudankwa and Kufuado on Tuesday said the country lost more than 13.5 billion Ghana cities in revenue in 2020 because of the economic shocks induced by the coronavirus pandemic. In his State of the Nation address to the Parliament, the President said with additional expenditures related to stemming the tide of COVID-19, estimated at 11.8 billion Ghana cities, the combined effects of the com of the pandemic, I beg your pardon, amounted to 25.3 billion Ghana cities, which makes 66%, 6.6% of gross domestic product. Indeed, the cost of COVID-19 has been enormous. Our overall economic growth rate for 2020 
was reviewed downwards from 6.8% to 0.9%. The non-oil economy was also revised from 6.7% to 1.6%. Revenue shortfall was estimated at 13.5 billion CDs, with additional expenditures related to stemming the tide of COVID-19 estimated at 11.8 billion CDs, with a combined effect amounting to 25.3 billion CDs, or 6.6% of GDP. The resultant fiscal deficit for 2020 was thus revised from 4.7% of GDP to 11.4% of GDP. This was done to reflect the impact of the pandemic. The Institute of Energy Security, IES, a think, a think tank, has blamed the recent power outages on poor maintenance and upgrade of the transmission system owing to Ghana grid companies' illiquidity, which continues to render the grid weak and unable to withstand shocks. The poor maintenance regime due to the liquidity challenge of the operator is evident in the increasing levels of transmission losses in recent times. The IES therefore called on governments to work to address the cash flow challenges of Gridco, the electricity, electricity company of Ghana, and other sectorial utilities to enable them carry out effective operations and maintenance to forestall the persistent system failures that continue to undermine power service delivery. That's it for this week's edition of Bistec on Ghana Web TV. We are glad you could join on this program. But visit www.ghanaweb.com for more news stories. Visit our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are at the Ghana Web TV. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Ghana Web TV. My name is Na Oyokoti. Have a splendid weekend. <laughs>